translation tools to help our customers better understand how the underlying mechanisms driving patient variability interact with uh, our customers' uh, products mechanisms of action uh, and really understand those intersections in a way that they can better understand uh, predictions uh, for novel therapies, uh, novel trial designs, and have that impact uh, uh, decision-making for the design of, of, of clinical programs and research programs. Over the last year, we've made uh, some very significant investments uh, in our uh, in our modeling platforms, in our software technology, so we're moving in some, some uh, very powerful directions that, uh, uh, among other things, really resonate with uh, uh, the agenda around personalized medicine. So uh, it's a nice opportunity this morning to, uh, to talk through some of those. Um, a little bit of a background. Um, if you look about the DNA of Intellos, there's certainly the core issues around mechanistic modeling of how we look at uh, modeling the dynamics of complex biological systems. But another core thread of how we look at that modeling and the applications of it comes from the field of decision analysis um, that really deals with how do you make decisions under uncertainty and the decision analytic background really sets the stage for this approach that we have that we'll be talking about for hypothesis management. And so you'll see that that come up uh, a little bit throughout the uh, throughout the presentation. So, with regard to personalized medicine and what's going on uh, in pharmaceutical research, uh, the hope is that as we bring new uh, new drugs into the market, as our customers bring new drugs into the market, that they will work on everyone, they will achieve the desired efficacy, and they will achieve blockbuster status. Um, the reality is that oftentimes. Uh, it uh, drug the drugs may uh, demonstrate more as a as a me too drug. The opportunity, however, is to look at this from a personalized medicine perspective. Because by the time that you have uh, your compound, by the time that you bring it into the clinic, uh, the mechanism of action is fixed. The the background variability in the patient population is fixed. There's there's a real limit to how much leverage you can get to demonstrate efficacy. Uh, just through changing uh, uh, protocols and changing dosage, the biggest leverage that you have is around patient selection. And there's the real opportunity with regard to looking at personalized medicine. Now, clearly, um, as, you, as you look at biasing your trial toward responder subpopulations, uh, there is this, this business trade-off between market size and demonstrated efficacy. So our job is not to, to help you make that um, or to, to decide that trade-off, but rather to inform you on what that trade-off may be so that from a business perspective you can make, our customers can make that trade-off ourselves. So there's the opportunity to turn a, a drug that, that would be a Me Too or wouldn't even be approved to something that is approved for an uh, admittedly sm smaller market, but how do you achieve that? How do you realize that opportunity? Well, first off, you need to understand what the true potential of your drug is to begin with. Um, if you're developing a drug uh, with the idea that it's a blockbuster, but it's really only going to be working the way that you want it to be in a, in a subpopulation, then you're going to be surprised in clinical trials. So, so the key question is, is being able to anticipate whether you're heading more for a, uh, a blockbuster reality or something that looks more like personalized medicine. And then the standard questions of what are the biomarkers that you need to measure to identify those responders and what are the patterns across those biomarkers that are actually going to predict responsiveness. So this is sort of the view from the pharma side uh, of the world. From the healthcare side of the world, uh, the opportunity is, is different and it's really all about, uh, about saving costs. So if you look at a, uh, at, a, at a population of individuals, there are some individuals that are higher risk, that are on disease trajectories where they're going to be uh, costing the healthcare system uh, much more money than, than, than the average patients. So <clears throat> the term that is, uh, uh, that is often referred to is bending the curve, uh, of pulling that curve uh, down and to the right and doing that by stratifying patients to understand those patients that are most at risk, to focus resources on those patients, both with regard to, to therapies but also with regard to things like adherence, um, and to really optimize their care, to understand, you know, what are the, what are the best drugs and what are the, the best lifestyle interventions, particularly in uh, cardiometabolic disease, that are actually going to have uh, an impact on changing their disease trajectory. Um, realizing this opportunity is uh, very similar to, to issues on pharma. 
Um, except here, the, the question is, the predictive question is more about the patient as opposed to the drug. Uh, what is the disease trajectory that each one of your patients is on? Uh, and again, the questions around collecting more information to clarify. What are the diagnostics that you would use uh, for that particular patient, given your state of information on that patient uh, for the data that you already have? And then what patterns are going to predict disease risk and what patterns uh, are going to predict responsiveness to therapy? So significant opportunities on both the pharma side and on the healthcare side. And when you look across them, the themes are very common of, uh, uh, of being able to, to take different classes of data, be able to make predictions on those, have those predictions inform decisions, ultimately trying to get the right drugs to the right patients. But it's uh, uh, sort of two sides of the same coin here. On the pharma side, you're trying to optimize patients for the drug. On the healthcare side, you're trying to optimize uh, drugs for the patient. The conference uh, has been muted. The conference has been unmuted. Uh, the conference has been muted. Decision making. Then uh, there are additional common themes on both sides. On the data side, you really have two classes of data. You've got data that is more global, data that is, that is uh, published on the disease state, uh, even data for, from a, a pharma company on um, uh, uh, other drugs in their portfolio that are relevant uh, to this particular biology and for all the compounds that, that, that you may be uh, evaluating. And one of the challenges with that global data is that it can be very fragmented, that the data comes from different, uh, uh, different, patient, uh, different patient groups, different inclusion criteria. You're running different protocols under different time frames, and you're collecting uh, uh, different measurements uh, from each of those patients. Um, Complementing that global perspective of the data, you have decision-specific data uh, for your particular drug uh, that you're guiding through the pipeline or for a particular patient. Um, and the issue there is that, yes, you would like to collect more data, uh, you would like to, to collect more biomarkers, um, you would like to uh, run more diagnostics on your patient, but that data costs money. And particularly in the healthcare setting uh, today, uh, you need to justify um, the value uh, that you're going to get in cost savings by collecting that more data, a key concept from decision analysis uh, called uh, value of information. So there are those key aspects with, re with regard to the data. And then the decisions themselves that you're looking at, these are really recurrent decisions, uh, particularly with regard to that, to that global data, that um, these are decisions that pharma is making repeatedly for the different drugs that they have in their pipeline and recurrently as the drugs move through the pipeline, and certainly in the healthcare setting uh, where you're making many of these decisions. So because these are recurrent decisions, it is advantageous to look at uh, making investments in decision support systems uh, that will actually help both pharma and healthcare organizations uh, navigate, uh, navigate this space. Now, one of the things that we said at the, uh, uh, at the outset of the talk was sort of positioning this approach on hypothesis management, which I will get to, uh, against the uh, uh, sort of the standard of uh, sort of big data statistical approaches. And one of the issues with statistical approaches is that you're really, uh, it's, the predictions are really driven by correlations that you're seeing back in that global data and how they apply to the decision-specific data that you're looking at. Now, I'd like to give just a, a brief heads up uh, from, uh, from an old case study.